Hello, bruv. We're back with the Burgermeister's daughter. Scandal. In a 16th century German town. We'll pick back up at page seven. The father, a merchant, investor, and politician, Hermann Buschler, 1470 to 1543, was a proud and powerful councilman and five times the city's burgermeister, holding that top post in 1508, 1514, 1517, 1520, and 1525. At this time, Hall's 24 councilmen were not freely elected by the citizen, citizenry at large. Why is this margin right at the crotch? But co-opted by the council itself, which also elected the Burgermeister annually on July 25th. That's my brother's birthday. From its own ranks, a system of government that kept the circles of political power exceedingly small, although not necessarily from a contemporary point of view. As the city's principal magistrate, the Burgermeister, was similar to a modern mayor, save for the fact that he served at the will of the council rather than at that of an electorate. A career politician, Hermann Buschler, had held some government post in the city since 1492. That's when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, wasn't it, bruv? His family had grown rich by selling wine and investing in real estate. In, in real estate, by 1499, when Anna was a toddler, he had gained, he had attained a taxable wealth of 7,600 golden, a notable sum at the time. By 1520, he was the city's richest man, and his the grandest house on Market Square. Between 1513 and 1525, no man in Hall wielded greater influence over city policy or commanded more respect from the citizenry. Hermann Buschler spoke with equal authority to the outside world, often representing the city at territorial diets, where key political decisions affecting the entire region were made. During the latter, later Middle Ages, the family progressively became the center of work and life, as the responsibility for the production of society's goods shifted from the large manorial households to the small urban family and the industries and its labor fuel, a process that has been described as familiarization of work and life. It was customary at this time for all children to work, girls as well as boys, this they did by age 13 or 14 at the latest, and orphan children might be placed in service at as early as six or eight, because being able to support oneself independently was a condition of a proper marriage. Girls who could not bring wealth into a marriage by means of a dowry from their fathers or an inheritance from their mothers might spend eight, ten, or even more years at domestic service before they and their prospective husbands had the means to marry. While all girls worked, the daughters of royalty and the urban mobility did not do so outside the home. Oh, nobility, not mobility. Sorry, bruvs. Destin, let's read that again. While all girls worked, the daughters of royalty and the urban nobility did not do so outside the home. Destined for marriage at an early age, if not sent away to a cloister at an even earlier one, they spent their entire childhood at home where they were educated and taught the homemaking skills they would need as wives. It was also rare for girls from rich burger families like Herman Bushler's to work outside the home. Anna, however, did work outside the home, but in a special place, the nearby castle of the Limpurg Schenks, just beyond the city walls to the south. For Anna, it was a brisk 20-minute walk from her all home, but exhausting as entry to the castle lay at the end of a long serpentine climb. Although very minor royals in the service of the Holy Roman Emperor, the Shanks were nonetheless local 
potentates. In the class-conscious world of the 16th century, they had a significantly higher social standing than the Bushlers, who were non-noble merchants. But as the Burgermeister's daughter, Anna was a special person wherever she was, and she became an informal friend and associate of the royal family as well as their servant. She kept house and sewed for Schenk and Marguerite, Marguerite, the former Countess of Schlick, and the wife of Schenk Gottfried the Tooth, 1474 to 1530, Lord of Castle Limburg, 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 and the lands south and southeast of the Hall. Marguerite was also the mother of eight children, among them the teenage future Schenk Asmus, or Erasmus, 1502 to 1553, who was four to six years Anna's junior. After her mother's death in December 1520, Anna came back to her father's mansion on Market Square, today incorporated into the Hotel Adelshoff, to take her mother's place as his full-time housekeeper. Anna was by this time a mature woman in her early 20s, between 22 and 24. She returned home at her father's command and against her own wishes. She had liked her position in Castle Limburg. Limp, Jesus, I gotta stop saying Limp, Limburg. In Castle Limburg, and having just passed the age when most all women married between 19 and 22, and moved outside the parental home, she must have felt very self-conscious about returning to hers. By all accounts, her father was an extraordinary man, and townspeople considered his relationship with his daughter to be out of the ordinary as well. They led a strange life together, one witness observed, alluding to the high degree of freedom the Burgermeister gave his daughter and a very bold exercise of it. In 1527, Armand Bushler would retire quietly from the city council in no small part because of the scandal he and his daughter created in the city in the years immediately preceding. But a decade and a half earlier, Herman Bushler had been the town hero and seemingly destined to lifelong tenure on the council. How long does this go, bruv? It goes a long way. Maybe a long read. Between 1510 and 1512, his leadership had secured forever the political rights of non-patrician burghers, Mittelberger, the upper, upper middle classes, and artisans, handworker, in city government, deep social divisions had plagued Hall and its governing council for centuries. And in these years, they were being exacerbated again by the old waning noble patrician families. This margin is really tight. I just don't like it. Old waning noble patrician families, habit of constantly reminding the ever larger burgher and artisan classes of their inferior lineage. All in a vain, all in a vain and occasionally tragicomic attempt to dampen the latter's political ambitions and drown out their voice in the city council. But these groups were now too many and too strong to be denied. Almost half of the city's roughly 1,100 households would be headed by master artisans by 1550, and some of them, like the bakers and the butchers, were already, were already wealthy men in 1510, and the city also coped with a large, restless underclass, as 40% of its household paid no tax, or less than one-tenth of the average tax. Hall, however, was too important a city for its overlord, the Holy Roman Emperor, to permit crippling social and political division to continue, long the site of a major imperial salt works, supplying the needs of people in Franconia and Württemberg, Hall was also the home of the imperial coin works. In 1156, the city had received from the imperial government its market regulations, which allowed it 
to levy tolls and the right to coin its own money, thereby making it officially a city. In its new coat of arms, portrayed a cross above a hand or glove or above two hands or gloves, indicating one or both of these new privileges. Around the same time, the famous hall penny, the holler or heller, was struck. Then, in 1276, King Rudolf of Habsburg recognized Hall as an imperial city, thereby freeing it from the long-resented rule, reduced to mere consensual protection in 1260, of the Limburg Schenk, who from their castle on a neighboring hill had long acted as the Lord of Hall on behalf of the emperor, they had also hoped and plotted for generations to absorb Hall into their own lands. Imperial city-states gave Hall both a new autonomy. What does that say? Statutes? Nope. Imperial city status, pardon, gave Hall both a new autonomy. Henceforth, it was directly answerable only to the emperor a new protection from the shanks of Limburg and other noble predators in the surrounding land, noble predators and other noble predators in the surrounding lands whose ambitious ambitions and designs on the city did not cease because of its imperial status a reich a reich Schult, schultes a reich schultes or imperial mayor, would now reside in the city, bearing the staff of royal authority in the emperor's name, administering justice in matters affecting the emperor, and overseeing the tolls and other sources of imperial income in the city. Internal social and political conflict of the kind besieging Hall in 1510 was not unprecedented. Already in 1261, as it was becoming a self-governing free city, the noble aristocrats, sorry, I'm scratching my arm, the noble aristocrats who then dominated city government and the baggers who desired a greater role in its squared off in class warfare fashion. In that year, the burghers rebelled against the magistrate's ordinance to reduce the length of cellar entries to attached houses and taverns to under 75 centimeters. As people were falling into them when they walked the narrow streets of the city at night, the intended result of the protest, however, was less to delay the implementation of the new ordinance than to make a successful show of bagger strength. Although noblemen in the city who, were all, who also were not councilmen and resented it, also joined the protest. On both scores, the beggars made their point. Not only was the ordinance temporarily withdrawn, but 20 to 30 noble families moved out of the city, ostensibly in search of more tranquil residents elsewhere. A more serious protest came in the 14th century. After the city's councils, after the city council's controlling patrician chamber Oberrat passed a 10% tax on all baggers. This brought swift resistance from the council's lower chamber. Chamber? Chamber. Fucking New Yorker now. Lower chamber, Unterrat, which represented the guilds and had long thought sought the merger of the two bodies and a fair sharing of power. Other noblemen in the city also joined the protest. When the patricians struck, stuck to their decision against the popular majority, the city erupted in rebellion. Emperor Louis of Bavaria, 1314-1347, moved to contain the class warfare by broadening the franchise along the lines desired by the majority of citizens. He did this by a famous ruling in 1340 that both rest restructured, restructured the city's political representation and merged the two representative bodies in the new construction. Const Jesus. All right, bruv. Let me regroup. I'll slap myself and get me back on track. There you go, bruv. 
should be good. In the new constitution, the old patrician family's exclusive right to the highest council position was rescinded. Property owners, beggars, and artisans in the city were given majority representation in the council. Regardless of their lack of noble lineage, under the new formula, Hall was henceforth to be ruled by a 26-member council composed of 12 noble patricians variously described as Geschlechter, Junker, or Edo Luton. Luton. Who held the decisive ranks of judges, Richter, six wealthy middlebaggers, Ritter, Bertig, Mittelberger, Ilbareberger, and eight artisans, handworker. The middle workers were a, the middle baggers were a fast rising group between the old patriciate and the traditional artisan classes and included prosperous merchants and guild masters who had acquired significant properties propertied wealth and income from rents and trade, although none of them were patrician by birth or necessarily even of local ancestry. Many in this group had married into noble families and believed themselves to be of equal worth in every way. Once again in 1340, as in 1261, the beggars had successfully demonstrated their power, and again, as in 1261, some noble families moved out of the city in protest. The Constitution of 1340 kept the peace in the hall for over a century and a half, but it did not end the social division within the council, much less within whole society. In the early 16th century, the peace was again shattered by what began as a petty dispute over the right of non-patrician members of the council to enter a special taproom, which the patrician members snobbishly reserved to themselves. <clears throat> Herman Bushler's erstwhile friend and frequent companion in the conduct of council business, Rudolf Nagel, led the opposition to the entry of low-born baggers and artisans. The tap room in question was on the market square in the house of a rich widow, <clears throat> and local philanthropist named Sybil Egan died 1538, who later gained local fame as a patron of the Protestant Reformation. Entrance was restricted to those who were members of a local patrician, family either by birth or by marriage, a bit of arrogance that created over the years a festering soul within the council threatening the city's political unity as well as its social harmony. In 1505, one wealthy non-patrician councilman dramatically protested his ostracism by bequeathing his wealth to another town. By what seemed to Herman Bushler pure sophistry, he too was deemed to fail the test of nobility and denied entry. Although his family had lived for generations in all, it was not, a, it was not patrician and while he had married into an old patrician family, it was not local. His wife, Anna Hornberger, was a Rothenberger, not a hauler. On the other hand, he did have a patrician lineage by marriage, and his taxable wealth at this time of 6,800 golden ranked him fifth among the 26 councilmen. And he also had served the city as a burgermeister in 1508. How could so wealthy and prominent a citizen deny, be denied entry to a taproom for councilmen? For his noble counterparts on the council, the answer was simple and centuries old. Without a noble birth, the burgermeister lacked the requisite honor. Other non-patrician members of the council shared Herman Bushler's pride and resentment, and with their support, he made an issue of discriminatory policy. Bursting into the forbidden tap room, he was advised that he might drink wine there as a courtesy, but that he would be welcomed by the patricians only as their guests, not as their equal. Moralizes the contemporary chronicler John Johann Harold, 
who records the episode from such pride, which has never brought about anything good. The dissension grew. The Spurn Burgermaster formally addressed the council on the issue of the tap room in November 1509. Was it not ridiculous, he asked his non patrician colleagues that they, a sizable majority of the council holding 14 of the 26 slots, should have to stand in rain or snow in the churchyard or by the fish market outside the tap room, while the noble, while their noble counterparts lounged and bargained in the warmth and comfort of their special room. By an initial vote of 16 to 10, rising to 19 to 7 in a second vote, now including two junkers, the council approved the obvious solution. The non-patricians would create their own taproom, where ordinary councilmen and honorable beggars, together with their noble sympathizers, might meet as equals. A room in a virtually new house next to St. James's church built in 1499 and used as a city hospice or infirmary spittle under the direction of the franciscan monks was designated and the necessary renovations were begun this development brought the dispute out of the tap room and onto the streets of hull as hull was now the regional center of the imperial industry and finance emperor maximilian one, 1493 to 1519, like emperors past, had watched, watched the deterioration of social order in his showcase imperial city with alarm. By April 1510, he had concluded that he must intervene, and an imperial commission of inquiry was in the city within a month. As if the conflict were none of their doing, the seven patrician councilmen who had fought to the end to keep their colleagues out of the tap room, complained loud and long to the commissioners about the great harm being done to the hospice by Herman Bushler's construction of a tap room there. They also denounced the Burgermeister as a man who had mismanaged the city's finances, unfairly fined the servants of the nobility, and packed the council with cronies and relatives. The latter are reference to his recent filing of three vacant patrician slots with honorable baggers, one of whom was a cousin. To the, to the shock and dismay of most holler, the commission concluded its investigation by ruling in favor of the patricians, and a few weeks later the emperor made the recommendations law. The latter not only ordered the new tap room under construction in the hospice to be eternally closed, but reformulated the Constitution of 1340, which had given the city 170 years of relative civil peace to increase the powers of the minority patrician faction within city government. The key provisions guaranteed the patricians their traditional 12 slots while adding to them the burgermeistership, seven of the city's 12 judgeships and an appointment to one of the two positions in every council office. In addition, the patricians were now put in a position to dominate the all-powerful Privy Council of Five, Der Geheim Funfer? Funfer? I don't know what it is, bruv. <laughs> That was arranged by requiring two patrician and two non-patrician members to serve on the latter with the Burgermeister because of the closer social relations and greater common political interests of patricians and burghers, with wealth at least here proving to be thicker than blood, the Burgermeister, who was almost always elected from one or the other group, could be counted on to side with the interests of the patricians against those of the artisans. For many hauler, the Dark Ages seemed to be returning to their city. The hearings before the commission had been intense and angry, so much so that at one point patrician threats caused Herman Bushler to flee the city in fear for his life. With the implementation of the new ruling, he and four of his allies were voted out of office and replaced with three junkers and two artisans. The defeated five protested both the revolution and the terror of, to the Imperial Supreme Court in Speyer, 
but their opponents had the more influential contacts there. Herman Bushler was not, however, one to take insult and defeat lying down. He knew how to get even and soon demonstrated his mettle in a way that even his closest friends could have anticipated. He decided to protest the commission's decision in a private audience with the emperor himself. And so that end he and to that end he set out for Frankfurt. What's that say? Frankfurt am Main. Am Main. As to the protest in Hall against the new constitution were growing louder. He believed the emperor might be persuaded to rescind it. Hall's patricians, however, with Nagel in the forefront, were once again were again one step ahead of Herman Bushler, and their friends at court effectively closed the emperor's door to him. Not to be denied, the Burgermeister decided to accost the emperor directly in public <laughs> and in a most dramatic fashion. He chained him to a table for six months. No, that didn't happen. Not to be denied, the Burgermeister decided to accost the emperor directly in public and in a most dramatic fashion, barefoot and dressed in coarse wood, wool, coarse wood, coarse wool with dirt and ashes strewn over his bare head, a small wheel tied to his chest, a rope hung around his neck, an unsheathed sword and sword in one hand and a written plea in the other, he waited along the emperor's route and cologne. When his associates realized what was happening, they thought him mad and tried to conceal him from the emperor's sight, but they acted too late. Thus confronted by the Burgermeister of all, the Emperor received his petition, which asked for a private hearing of his case and also explained the supplicant's strange attire. It was Herman Bushler's resolve to die gladly by rack, wheel, rope, or sword, the three traditional means of execution should the Emperor find his cause unjust upon hearing it. This was the kind of gamble legends are made of, and soon thereafter the Emperor ordered a new commission. This time composed of a distinguished delegates from uh, over a dozen South German imperial cities to take a second look at the situation in Hall. Given the popular outcry against the new construction in Hall, that reassessment would very likely have occurred anyway. But Herman Bushler's theatrics had hastened that decision, and he would forever be remembered for it. The new commission met in Hall in mid-October 1512, confronted by a citizenry, the greater part of which demanded the immediate restoration of the Constitution of 1340. The result was a complete victory for Herman Bushler's side in a dramatic public ceremony. The prior of the Comberg Monastery, acting in the person of the emperor, cut the imperial seal from the first commission's ruling, thereby declaring it null and void. While the event was no social revolution, it did enhance the power and influence of the city's affluent non-patricians. As in the past, several old patrician councilmen resigned their citizenship and departed Hall to live among more deferential folk, leaving behind still more vacancies in the council for Herman Bushler's honorable burghers to fill. Many of those these beggars, like the beggar Meister himself, already fancied themselves patricians anyway. Philip Bushler, Herman's eldest son, who would twice become the Burgermeister himself at mid century, fifteen forty nine and fifteen fifty one, proudly claimed that the title Junker on the grounds of his mother's noble lineage. Not only did he marry into a local patrician family, he took as his wife Alfra. All Afra Senft, the daughter of Gilg Senft, one of the seven patricians who had opposed his father to the very end during the confrontation of 1510. For a generation after the Second Commission's restoration of Hall's constitution, the city's burgermeister would be a patrician either by birth or by marriage. Still, Herman Bushler's defiance and Daring had helped put new le leadership permanently in City Hall, one less bound to the social order of the Middle Ages, and, as we will see, to the Church of Rome as well. That change spared the city some lethal political conflict during the second decade of the 16th century. 
and it made the city more receptive to the Protestant Reformation in the Third. The successful resolution of the constitutional crisis also established Herman Bushler's heroic reputation in Hall's history. All right, Brav, we will continue next time with the Dota Anna. Jerry out. Jerry out.